session <laughs> at, the end of the, at the end of the day. Um, so this session is about district heating mostly, uh, except for my presentation, <laughs> which is actually on electric heating. And I'm very, very much looking forward to to hear uh, about um, district heating. I see there are a lot of presentations from Nordic, I mean, yeah, German Nordic countries. So we will have uh, first um, Pedro, who will talk about district heating in, in Germany, then Gianluca uh, in Denmark, and then Leonard uh, will, will do a presentation on cogeneration and heating networks coupling or something like that, I think, if I understood the abstract right. And last, I will be talking about uh, electrification of heating in France, uh, which is a bit different, but uh, I think um, all in all, it's always about decarbonizing heating. Um, so uh, please, um, Pedro, the, the floor is yours. Uh, we, are, we are looking forward to, to your presentation. I'm going to try to share my presentation. And... Yes. Did I? <laughs> Perfect. We see your slide. Maybe you could put them in full screen mode. Yes. Now you should. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Bianca, for the introduction. I just want to start with the time. Um, yeah, thank you very much again. Um, I, my name is Pedro Giron. Uh, I'm representing the group of the Business Models and Market Integration Group of the Fraunhofer Institute for Energy Economics and Energy System Technology. And today I will present the transformation path of local district heating uh, with electricity and heat sector coupling in Germany. Um, I appreciate uh, everybody's here today um, joining. Uh, our presentations in this conference, online conference. Um, just to summarize the, uh, what we are going to be uh, to, to see today, uh, we are going to see the problem formulation, the short description and the introduction, what is the political framework, the regulatory framework, uh, the methodology used, the simulation and parameters that, that we have used, and the results at the end, uh, the discussion, and obviously, uh, a brief conclusion of this um, uh, simulation of, of this study case that we have done. Um, a brief description of our uh, institute here in Kassel. Uh, we research in the field of energy economics and energy system technology. Um, there are plenty of um, um, additional um, uh, topics, areas, and departments that uh, we consider uh, considering uh, the whole system, uh, energy product, energy supply system. Uh, in this case, uh, our group is more in the energy economics and system design uh, department. Um, yeah, um, starting with the, um, with the presentation. I just wanted to. I, I just want to. I, I wanted to um, to state the problem that we um, decide to to solve here uh, with the scope of combining this technical uh, approach to the transformation process in the energy system, focusing on the district heating. Uh, important will be to see that uh, the cooperation that we have done uh, with four use cases, uh, talking about the portfolio investments and the optimal combinations of the specific technologies in a, for, a, for, a, for a heating supply system, um, also the energy coverage for a planning horizon of 35 years. Uh, the main question, uh, research question is, what combination is the optimal combination, is the optimal portfolio to achieve the climate protection targets that we have here in Germany? Uh, with high renewable energy shares in the heat supply. Um, yeah, what is this political framework actually? Uh, we have a very ambitious uh, goals in, uh, starting for the 2020, 2030, but the most important is to be complete uh, carbon neutral 
to, to, 12, to uh, 2015. That would be the, the most important things I, I would say. Um, for that, we have the legal framework. We have a uh, specific laws, uh, act, uh, uh, mechanisms uh, that this Federal Climate Change uh, Act uh, provides, also together with this coal fire phase out act. Both uh, are the main uh, mechanisms that um, the federal uh, uh, government is um, provides to, 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 to achieve that um, uh, climate goals, I would say. Um, it is clear that the impact of this political framework needs to be assessed, assessed and it has its impact also on social regulatory, uh, regulatory framework and technological innovation also. As, uh, as, as a main component for the transformation paths of those district heatings. Right? Um, what regulatory framework specifically? Uh, we have three, uh, uh, three mechanisms that we, that we would like to, to, to understand a little bit what is the impact. The first one is this Combined Heat and Power Act. Um, Summarize it, it is a subsidy as it is an incentive for the operation of gas turbines, for example, or combined cycle uh, gas turbines or CHP engines in general terms. Um, in general terms, it, it is a uh, 30,000 full loads hours uh, requirement that, that we need to, that they need to fulfill uh, if the investment is done between 2020 and 2030, right? After that, we have this 40% capex incentive. It is also a subsidy um, for the thermal generation premium. Uh, for the second one, this federal funding for efficient heating networks, uh, we take the premium, this, you know, this, this variable operation um, pre heating uh, premium coming from renewable energies. If it is, uh, for example, a solar thermal energy uh, technology, or a heat pump. In, in, uh, why the heat pumps? Because we assume that uh, they will going to get the electricity from renewable uh, sources, right? That if it is, the, if, the, if the investment is done before 2030, what happens after? We assume a 40% capex incentive also in the form of a subsidy. Uh, Combine this, um, uh, renewable energy premium, we have this variable network um, uh, cost avoided just for the heat pumps if they allow uh, to be uh, operated in, more, in a more flexible way. That's the idea of the last uh, mechanism in the German Energy Industry Act um, that we are considering also. Um, in order to do that, to do that, uh, we have this mathematical formulation. Uh, important will be to say that we are maximizing um, an objective function that uh, calculates the difference between incomes and cost. And the variable of the incomes we consider in those incentives, these subsidies, this variable. Uh, operational incentives uh, for the heat pumps uh, and for the uh, combined heat and power engines, generation units. That's uh, pretty much the most important thing of the mathematical formulation. And in general terms, we have also the typical uh, restrictions, maximum, minimum restrictions connecting the source uh, and the consumption side of the energy supply system, uh, obviously, obviously with true uh, efficiency uh, rate. Specifically for the heat pumps, uh, we have this uh, temperature dependent coefficients, this coefficient of the performance for the heat pumps will be the only thing uh, different, uh, I will say, or uh, spe special to be mentioned, um, that we use as a mathematical formulation of the problem that we uh, uh, 
um, mentioned, uh, explained before. Uh, what framework do we use? Uh, we have our own optimization environment. Uh, it is called Invescope. And for that, we, we have a bunch of input data, the consumption curves, temperature, like I'd say, uh, obviously the technical uh, cost, technical data uh, cost, operational cost, investment cost. And the regulatory framework is obviously a really important uh, uh, part that we have already mentioned. Everything goes into our optimization model in the scope and we see, we are going to see uh, uh, in a few seconds, the result that we get from, uh, from that uh, simulations. Um, the environment is based on the Python. Uh, it is a Python based environment. Uh, we consider a, a optimization horizon or a planning horizon of 35 years. Um, we have, uh, try, we have uh, cut the simulation time or uh, trying to, 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 to do it a little bit faster also with this uh, support here, uh, uh, technique or methodology, which states that we have, for example, for 2020, we have five years. Uh, it, it, 2020 is the representative year of the time frame from 2018 18, uh, to 2000. And 22, <laughs> and we take one year as representative as a representative of those five years, having seven years for this whole horizon or planning horizon. Right. Um, apart from that, we have uh, the annual increase of demand uh, and an hourly resolution. Um, we call heating consumption, heating consumption curve with um, network temperatures uh, for every uh, support year. And the forecast of electricity prices, Levi's U2 prices considered or taking uh, what is written in the climate action program. Uh, with this set, uh, we have we need the technological options, right? Um, for the scenarios where we have existing power plants, we just consider two technologies as coal-fired CHP engines and combined cycle gas turbines are the two existing technologies. The options are quite um, uh, are a few options uh, coming from CHP engines, boilers, heat pumps, solar thermals, waste heat. Um, that everything that uh, all of these op uh, optional technologies are available for the fourth scenario for for all the scenarios that we are simulating. The basic scenario, like I said, uh, it takes the the the, 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 um, the list of alternatives of, uh, of of generation units and and see what's the the optimum. Um, combination, considering also the regulatory framework that we have mentioned, talking about the premiums and the incentives, the investment incentive for the gas turbines or CHP engines. The second one is interesting because we have this existing natural gas combined cycle gas turbine of 200 megawatts, and we consider the commissioning for or by 2035. The last two. Uh, we put together the coal fire phase out act, uh, saying well, that we are going to shut down some of the coal fire uh, CHP engine till uh, 2030, and the other ones will be out in 2035 for the for the fourth scenario. We're going to go through now each of these uh, scenarios. Just going to see the results uh, in the left hand side. We see install capacity for every support year. And the right hand side, we see the heat demand coverage for every support year. Remember that we have uh, simulated this with an hourly resolution. So the dynamics, internal di dynamics of what happens every hour, we, we are not uh, are, 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 are there, but uh, we are we're just uh, taking a look uh, at the sum of the, all, uh, the sum of the, or the total yearly uh, production of each engine or each group of technology. Uh, important in, in this 
reference case or basis scenario are that we have in the first year um, the installation. Remember that we don't have an existing uh, power plant here. We 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 co we have the the result. We cover the the demand with CHP engines or gas turbines, almost fifty percent of the installed capacity, and the rest of it it is natural gas boilers. Why? Because we need to cover the peak demand, uh, more or less. That would be the only reason uh, for the heat pumps and for solar thermal is interesting. Um, that we already have uh, investments uh, uh, first year, but uh, because of the coverage or the, the incentive for the gas turbines or, or the CHP engines, we don't see more investments until a little bit late. We have this cross uh, in, in late in the year 2035, 2040, uh, where we see natural gas boilers and heat pumps to, to switch, to switch the coverage actually. And we see that the lap, due to the lifetime uh, end of the uh, CHP engines that we have already invested in the first year, um, they, the, the mix, the energy mix switches, right? And the second uh, scenario is pretty much the same with the difference that due to this, the minimum or the full load hours requirements of the natural gas, this existing natural gas combined cycle a gas turbine, this uh, purple uh, investment that I have here, or in this in the capacity that I have here, um, it push a little bit um, uh, to the future, the investments that I need for the heat pumps, for example, 2040, 2040 right? Uh, another thing interesting to mention here, we don't see any solar thermal technology regardless that we have this renewable energy premium since the 2000 since the year 2020 um that will be pretty much um the the interesting thing here and after the phase out or the decommissioning of this power plant on uh, after 2035 we see the the uh, the, the change to heat pumps basically and with less capacity, we reach higher coverage of the heat uh, demand, right? Uh, that, that are two more important things, actually. Um, the third one, we see already uh, uh, first case where we have a coal fire power plant phase out. And for the year 2025, one um, block and 2030, the second block, right? Um, it is interesting to see that we uh, have this first investment on a natural gas gas turbine, mainly because of the uh, fixed investment incentive and the, the requirement of the full load hours requirements, right? That's, that's the most, uh, 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 this is it, or that's where the decision lies in this use case. After that, because of the lifetime ends for these specific um, technologies, we see the, the same switch, the, the switch of technology for the heat pumps and important would be to say maybe these electrical boilers, we need something, we need the technology to cover the peaks of the heating demand, right? Um, maybe just to mention that the waste heat, I didn't mention anything uh, until now, the, the, the waste heat is always in best, but because of the, the, because mainly of the cost of the production cost, the energy coverage or the generation of the waste uh, technological unit, it, it, it is a, a little bit higher after because we first we have the full out, full load hours requirements here for the for the uh, coal fire power plants and for the CHP engines and the premium of the heat pumps is higher high enough to substitute the waste heat 
the first five representative years. Um, the last scenario, uh, we see also the phase out of the coal-fired power plant. And additional to that, uh, we, we, can, we can see that the boiler, uh, the natural gas boiler uh, gets also a little bit um, before than the previous scenario, mainly because we don't have this the CHP engine investment, right? Considering those results, we can say um, that there are multiple uh, things that can affect the development of or the substitution or the transformation paths of district heatings. Uh, one of them are the electricity costs, obviously, in the long run, and increase of the efficiency, and most of because uh, in the sense of the, uh, of the efficiency of the heating of the heat grids and the technological development, obviously. Um, important or, or interesting to, 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 to see what, what, what's the result for the sort of thermal energy. Despite of the subsidy, we don't see that, that, that big boom of the sort of thermal uh, resource, right? Um, with the heat pump or the renewable energy technologies could be, could be higher, it could be uh, uh, there a, a scenario where, where we see a higher amount of coverage uh, before or earlier, uh, but that depends if we have these premiums, these operational premiums before also, and if we are rich, uh, higher or larger or more efficient. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> or a more efficient capacities uh, in, the, in the following years, right? Um, an additional interesting uh, uh, discussion point was this bridge between technologies, right? The natural gas boilers, CHP engines, natural gas CHP engines are the technological bridge uh, for the future uh, technological penetration of heat pumps. Uh, conclusion, like I said, the, uh, regardless what kind of technology is, heat pumps should be there. Uh, to supply the heat demand, to cover to cover the heat demand, um, considering also that to reach enough enough or higher renewable energy shares, we need to support this investment cost. We need to incentivize the operational hours, for example, for the heat pumps, like we have seen, and to adapt the infrastructure, lower temperature, expand the network, uh, here in storage capacity also. Um, additional to the industrial waste, heat utilization, and the peak load hour technologies also are relevant, like, like we have seen for the electric, electrical boilers, for example. And like I said again, uh, natural gas CHP and natural gas boilers are the technological bridge uh, according to the results that we have seen. Right. And that's all. And if there are questions, I'm glad to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gianluca. I think it's a bit sad with the online conference. We don't have the applause, you know, at the end of <laughs> each presentation. Um, so is there any, any question? Uh, Leonard, I saw that you raised your hand. Oh, no, I was just clapping, sorry. <laughs> oh, OK, <laughs> right. Oh, sorry, it's a clapping, yeah. <laughs> right. So is there any question from the audience that some people joined us in the meantime? No, if not, I, I will I will start. Um, mm -hmm. um, I am a bit in, in, intrigued with the, all the cost data for for this kind of heat pumps, you know. Um I was wondering where, where you where you when to to look for them? Maybe you have access to, to direct data from the from the producers. I don't know, uh, because my my I mean my my feeling is that I've usually worked on residential and I think in tertiary and even more in in uh, heat networks, district heating. Uh, they are much much bigger scales, and uh, and uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, what were your sources and if you could have like it's a proportional cost or if there are lots of economies of scales compared to residential heat pumps. 
yeah, of course, uh, we have uh, our uh, uh, te 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 technical sources uh, here also. Uh, we have multiple different projects running uh, where we get uh, information of technological developments. And but um, yeah, the costs are definitely uh, uh, a component of, of the decision making, obviously. It is not the same to, to, you know, for, for a house or family house. Or if you talk about heat pumps, investments are uh, really, really different. Uh, yeah, uh, I can I can share after that uh, there are a couple of studies or, or um, master's thesis also around this topic that we have been working on. Okay, thank you. Yes, that would be nice. Yeah, you can you can write me to the email address. Okay. My email is there. <laughs> we will be fine. Any other question? Um, if not, uh, I propose that we move to the next uh, speaker. Mm -hmm. So I guess that uh, this is. Gianluca will be talking about uh, district heating in, in Denmark, right? Yes. So the floor is yours. Can you see the screen? Perfect, thank you. Uh, good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, my name is Gianluca Trotta, and I'm I'm going to present a study uh, that I carried out with uh, Anders Regan Hansen from the same university. I work at Aalborg University in Copenhagen, and uh, Stefan Sommer from the University of Bochum, uh, Germany. Uh, so this work uh, is a part of uh, ERC grant, and um, and in which we basically we analyze uh, residential energy consumption and also uh, and also um, the, 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 the residential sector but also the transport sector from different uh, angles. Um, so Denmark uh, has a very, I would say, very ambitious uh, climate goals. Climate goal. Uh, the government aim at reducing uh, greenhouse gas emission by 70% uh, compared to 1990 levels, uh, 1990 levels by 2030, and to achieve uh, climate uh, neutrality uh, by 2050. And um, there is an ongoing discussion about how to achieve this target. And and a hot topic right now is to impose a carbon tax or at least, or not to impose, but to increase substantially the carbon tax. So the Danish Council on Climate Change has suggested to increase the carbon tax from approximately 20 euros to 200 euros. And, um, and the government decide to uh, increase the carbon tax, but they still are still discussing uh, to how much this increase should be. Uh, um, and uh, of course, one of the sectors that will be affected by this increase in the carbon tax will be the district heating sector that, as you know, um, is uh, one of the most, uh, in Denmark is one of the most uh, um, developed uh, compared to other countries, is, is way developed, more developed, and uh, it's a a very efficient system to distribute uh, heat, uh, both for space heating and uh, water consumption. And, uh, and it represents 11% of the total final energy consumption. So it's, a, uh, it's an important, an important um, uh, component of the energy consumption and associated emissions. Um, to understand the effectiveness of a carbon tax, uh, it's very important to understand how consumers respond 
to price changes because of course the carbon tax will increase uh, the price that end, end user will have to pay and and uh, and uh, depending on how much they respond to this price increase these will have give an idea on how much this carbon tax will have an effect or not uh, on reduce or addressing externalities and reducing consumption um, so the objective of these studies is to estimate price and income elasticities of district in demand in Danish households uh, while controlling for socio-demographic and dwelling characteristics influencing uh, uh, district in demand. Uh, then we also want to explain a heterogeneity in district in, uh, in demand response to price pay changes because, of course, different household types can respond differently to price variation. And then, of course, the result can inform uh, the effectiveness of price policy uh, to reduce uh, energy consumption as a means to combat climate change. I'm now referring to carbon tax, but also other type of price policies. And also, um, these results could uh, inform uh, future needs and trends in energy demand and supply and also the design on, of energy efficiency policies. Um, so the data, uh, in, in Denmark, uh, we are quite lucky when we work with micro data because there is a huge availability of uh, data uh, because uh, every person has a, is assigned to, uh, uh, like also other Nordic countries, uh, every person is assigned a unique identification number. Uh, in which public authorities uh, store every type of personal information on a regular basis. Um, we combine this information with consumption and price data uh, uh, of district heating, annual uh, consumption uh, and price data from 299 utilities out of about 400. And um, and, uh, and then we also included other information about, for example, eating degree days and whether an household has received a eating allowance that was, was is, is a supplement to the eating costs uh, granted to pensioners. Um, and, and so the final unbalanced panel data is, uh, consists of about more than 100,000 uh, of households and span from uh, a five, uh, six year, a five years period. Um, one relatively important information is that uh, district heating uh, network, uh, district heating utilities are non-profit uh, regulated. Uh, that means that they are not allowed to make profit, but at the same time, there are huge variation in the price of district heating because the price of district heating depends on many factors, uh, especially production cost. So, so this is a very uh, simple uh, overview of the data. So we have district heating, energy consumption, uh, uh, information prices, income, the size of the household, eating allowance, uh, dwelling characteristics, and location, and so on. Uh, so the methodology. Uh, methodology, we employed both static and dynamic models. Um, I won't dwell into econometric details, but generally speaking, the advantages of dynamic models over uh, static models is that they can take into account the interdependence of consumption of uh, decision over time. Uh, that includes whether an household has invested in energy efficiency, retrofit, utilization behavior, uh, sluggish of uh, appliance stock adjustment, um, and to deal with the indigeneity issues of average prices, because we are using average prices here. Um, uh, there are different static models, there are different dynamic models. 
because of the nature of our data and because also it has several advantages over other dynamic models, we have used the bland uh, bond uh, system, two-step system uh, GMM model. Um, so this type of model, of course, account for the fact that consumer needs some time, to put it very simple, in a simple way, needs some time to react to price increase, to price changes. And, um, and this is, is taken into account by uh, including on the right side of the demand equation, uh, the, the lagged uh, dependent variable, and also we account for the indigeneity of the price variable. This is something that the static model cannot do it. Um, and this, of course, has an influence on the results. Um, um, so here I'm going to present first the result of the static models. So we run uh, OLS regression random effect and uh, fixed effect. Uh, as you can see from here, all or most, I would say all the coefficients have the expected sign and are significant. So of course, the, the consumption increase with income, household size, uh, the living area, uh, eating allowance, uh, the more the dwelling, the older the dwelling, the higher is the consumption. Uh, is uh, it also depends on the location because price is also, also affected by the location, uh, eating degree days, and so on. Uh, the problem here with static model is that the coefficient of the price elasticity is, I would say, inflated. Therefore, we run dynamic models. So we run uh, two, three dynamic models. Uh, and we included the lagged consumption of district heating and, uh, and, uh, and we got similar, very similar estimates for the sociodemographic and dwelling characteristic having an influence on the consumption, but the, the price elasticity is, um, has a value of uh, 0.489 compared, for example, to uh, uh, other to, to static models that have a, a, a value that is 0 0.79 or 0 0.8 and so on. So this provides, because of uh, the reason that I explained before, this provides a much more reliable estimates of the price elasticity. Uh, we also estimate the long run price elasticity because of, of course, in terms of policy implication, this is way more important than the short term uh, short run uh, price elasticity. And uh, so we get, we got estimates that range from 0 0.489 to 0 0.66 for the long run price elasticity. Uh, and of course, useless to say that price elasticity is just a number, but has a lot of implication and is uh, important not only for uh, evaluating uh, the effectiveness of carbon tax or other price policy, but also to inform some uh, model that uh, forecast future energy demand and energy supply needs. And um, so it's just a number, but uh, yes, I think it's very important. And um, um, so then we also estimated some heterogeneous effect. Here is a very simplified version of what we are doing right now. This is a work in progress. And so here, by estimating heterogeneous effect, we want to see which type of households are more or less responsive to price variation. Um, for example, here, um, uh, here we can see that low income households are slightly more responsive than high income households. Uh, households that consume more are more responsive than those that consume less. I think most of the results are, are, um, are pretty in line with the literature. And when I say literature, I mainly refer to probably most of the paper that analyze electricity and natural gas. Of course, the 
the, the, the magnitude is very different, can be very different because it depends on the context and so on. Uh, but um, uh, but there, there are not so, there is not so much, there are not so many papers about district kidney that analyze these issues. So uh, it's difficult also to compare with the existing literature, but um, all of them so far still make, se make sense. Uh, of course, also, for example, couples, so more, the more people are, uh, the more have potential to respond to uh, price uh, changes. Uh, here is, although it's not statistically significant, it's interesting to notice that also uh, males that are typically, typically uh, found that are more attentive to price signal and so on, are in fact more responsive, even if these results are not significant uh, than female. Um, so in conclusion, so we made this empirical analysis because we wanted to understand the price elasticity of district heating demand. And, uh, and also, of course, what are the factors that influence consumption and also the how the uh, price elasticity change according to different household group. Um, so we have found that the determinants of uh, consumption are uh, income, si household size, living area, eating degree days, or dwelling. So no result came as surprise. Everything as expected. Um, we we confirm uh, that the choice of the estimation method is very important. In, uh, in the price elasticity estimation. Uh, static models inflate price elasticity and, and, give, and pro provide not reliable estimates. Uh, dynamic models provide uh, different type of estimates, so uh, more uh, lower magnitude and, um, and are much more reliable because of uh, uh, because of several issues that I, uh, if we want later, we can go into detail. Uh, our preferred model, so the blended bond two-step system GG, GMM, uh, finds so this short-run price elasticity of 0 0.5489 and long-run price elasticity of 0 0.66. And of course, price elasticity varies as a function of income, consumption, dwelling tenure, gender, uh, as, as I showed you before, households with lower income and higher consumption level are more responsive to price increases. And this has, a, uh, has welfare implication as an impact of, uh, on the type of policy that the government could decide to implement or not. Uh, of course, so an increase in the carbon tax can clearly be effective in reducing demand and at the same time encouraging residential energy efficiency. My, my view is that when we, when we discuss uh, energy reduction or uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction, there is a, no silver bullet. Uh, it's clear that carbon tax can be effective but there is no single policy instrument that can reduce energy demand, address externalities, and maintaining uh, high welfare standards if it's applied in isolation. So much will depend also on how this increase in the carbon tax will be complemented with other supporting policy. And uh, also, uh, I still don't know how much this increase will be. And this, of course, will have an impact on, uh, on, uh, on the end user prices, depending also on how much the uh, utilities will pass on to the consumer, this increase in the production cost. And, uh, and much also will depend also on how the government, of course, will reinvest the uh, revenues that will be generated by this increase in the carbon tax. So there are um, there are several considerations that can be made, and uh, and uh, we are currently on uh, starting to think and to analyze how this result 
will have an impact on the policies that the government is planning uh, to implement. Thank you. Thank you, Gianluca. Very interesting. Is there any question from, from the audience? They will have a yeah. remark or maybe a yep. comment. <laughs> for what Please can, can I present. Yeah, yeah I, 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 it's really nice your presentation, Gianluca. Um, thank you very much for, for, for to prepare it. Um, and it, it is interesting how, how, how you mentioned how, what, what, you, what you mentioned about uh, that the carbon tax alone uh, will be not enough. You need a combination of different mechanism policies. It is something similar to what we have found also. And I agree, I would say it was really interesting and, and relieving <laughs> that way, I think also. Yeah, yeah of course, I, I think it's, uh... Uh, I mean, of course, it, I think it's probably possible to re reduce, uh, to address externalities significantly with carbon tax, but of course, then at what cost, right? So it's always about welfare implication because that is, at the end, is what governments care about or should care about, right? So it's, uh, uh, I think it's always, it's always the challenge for governments is always uh, I, i've been talking to some policy makers in the last years and it's always interesting uh, to to listen from them because it's always uh, you always get a different feeling on what we do in our uh, uh, office and what they say uh, i think uh, i think it's for for, for them, it's very difficult to find the right combination of policy instruments. Uh, because we can talk about carbon tax, we can talk about, I believe in the importance of energy efficiency investment, but at the same time, there are many other uh, non-pricing uh, instruments that can have also an impact. So my view is that is always to try to find the right combination of instruments uh, because the challenge is, I think, is too big to be solved uh, with one policy. I think, but I think this is this is often, uh, I mean, for any other problems also, right? Is it would be very naive to think that only one instrument can solve everything. Of course, yeah. so this, yeah. I agree. completely agree. A, a quick question. Uh, yes, please. Uh, Gianluca, I, I, I like the work. T thanks very much. Uh, I was looking at your results there and you found when household size increases, there's a slight increase in demand. But I would have thought as household size increases, there's a, a slight decrease in demand because there are more people living in the uh, in in a, in a dwelling and so the area per person might be actually reducing so and when i look at it, the overall model i i wonder about what is where is the increasing population of denmark which would lead to more dwellings coming in so it, it, i guess it's captured in the the floor area so i'm just thinking to myself if perhaps there's something there, there that's something you could look at to see if there's um if there's just a, some little missing uh, uh mechanism going on <clears throat> well i i i respectfully respectfully disagree because i think that the the, the uh, i didn't mention before but the so the, it's a, the model is, a log, is in a log-log framework. So of course the household size is in a, in a logarithmic form. And um, I think the, and we also control for the, for, for the area of the uh, dwelling. Uh, and and, and, and um, keep in mind that, or I, I think I didn't mention, but the, um, the analysis only focused on a single family detached house. 
because of course that that are those that are individually emitted so that are uh, were the only one where we could uh, link the consumption to the dwelling so there there's us basically say that uh, I, I didn't analyze in uh, probably something that they will do as, for example, categorical variable to see if the, the, if the consumption increase as uh, uh, the, if there are three or four persons or five persons. Uh, my guess is that they, it increased, but it's not, not proportionately. Um, yeah. but, uh, <clears throat> so, and then, and then the thing is that they, the district heating is um, space heating and water. So it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's quite large amount. And of course, the more, the more people, the more consumption. So that's the, and that is something that we found also in the heterogeneous effect that, that single compared to couple and uh, couple are more responsive. And also because I think they have more freedom in adjusting their consumption because they consume more. So that is my. Okay, but, uh, that's but, fine. but, uh, but uh, yes, I mean, we are, uh, I, I, we have been working uh, quite a lot, a lot not, not so much on the analysis, more on the data preparation, I would say, uh, but there is, this is still a work in progress. So we need to do some adjustment, but the main result I'm pretty sure would be the same. Okay, and just to follow up, in Denmark, do people say we need to reduce demand for district heating because if the sources are are waste heat perhaps it's not as big a priority to reduce it as you know oil heating or natural gas heating i i would have thought that it, it's it's not such a big deal uh, to encourage people to use less when it comes to district heating <clears throat> yeah, uh, I think, uh, thank you. I think this is a very good question. I, I would say yes, because the, at least from what policymakers are saying, the challenge is so big that they have to, they have to try different, uh, they have to tackle different problems. Even if the district heating is, is seen as uh, uh, very efficient and so on, but still there are uh, room for improvements also there, because also, as I said, it, it, it's a big part of the consumption. And it's true that the majority is produced by biomass. So that's, that there, there is no problem, but there is still something like 30%, uh, some, there is natural gas, oil, uh, that still is used for producing this heating. So I would say that this, scale of the challenge is still important there. Uh, then I don't know, there is always, of course, difference from what policymakers say and then what they actually do, but at least it seems that they are serious about it. Then we'll see. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah, I have a question, if there are not, uh, not other one from the audience. Uh, is for, in the beginning, you said that um, district heating is a very efficient uh, way of bringing heat to, to households, etc. Um, but I, I was wondering about the heat losses in, in the network, actually. So I think that district heating is supposed to be pretty much local. It's not supposed to be hundreds of kilometers. But on the other hand, uh, what I have in mind, just remembering some order of magnitudes, but I'm not if I don't know if they're right. But compared to a regular household with a gas boiler, for instance, mm -hmm. um, it seemed to me that um, the same apartment, let's say, uh, would consume more uh, final energy uh, if it was district heating because of the losses, um, maybe like 1.5 times the, the quantity. Is, is that correct? Could you, could you elaborate uh, a bit on that? Uh, I confess, uh, uh, I'm not an engineer, but uh, what I can tell you is that um, um, it's a, when they say it's efficient, it includes also the the, the fact that it doesn't lose doesn't lose uh, energy along the way. The thing is that it's not about district heating. Is that district heating when it's combined also with uh, combined heat power system. Mm -hmm. So so there are uh, it's not district heating alone, uh, but when it's together with combined and heat power system. Uh, that makes the distribution uh, also, I think, more efficient. 
Um, this is something that I, uh, uh, of course, I, I read, I did research, but I, I have to say that I did dig more into that. Uh, I'm an economist, but uh, sometimes I, I feel that I have to be more engineer in this way. But <laughs> this technical economic. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. It was very thank interesting. You. Um, if there's no other pressing question, I uh, propose that we move to the next speaker. So it's Leonard from uh, Technische Universität Berlin. We talk about um, cogeneration and heating networks. So the floor is yours. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Can you see my screen all right? And okay, perfect. So. Um, already introduced, I will speak about uh, cogeneration and heating networks in renewable energy systems. And um, why did I um, decide to address this question? Well, I think there are still many open questions about how um, renewable energy systems will look like and how they will function. In particular, there's this uh, huge debate about hydrogen, where it is a cost-efficient option for decarbonization, for what kind of applications and sectors. Um, there's still an ongoing debate, um, how can heat be supplied in renewable energy systems with rather different technologies being discussed, for example, um, hydrogen technologies. And uh, finally, there's this uh, looming question about how much thermal backup capacities will a renewable system require, because obviously wind and solar are fluctuating uh, sources. And when there's no wind, no solar, but there is demand, um, we need to have thermal backup capacities. And again, they are potentially also fueled by hydrogen. So as these questions uh, show, um, they, they closely intersect, and I think they're all intersect in the question of cogeneration and heating networks, because on the one hand, um, it um, affects the role of, of hydrogen as a synthetic fuel. Is it used for heating? Is it used uh, for backup plants and so forth? Um, but on the other hand, also electrification, which is very relevant for the decarbonization of the heating sector as well. Um, greatly impacts this question. For example, um, the share of electrification will greatly affect the need for thermal backup capacities because we know that uh, heat and electricity uh, peaks are closely correlated. And if a large share of heat uh, supply is electrified, we will also need uh, more backup power plants uh, to provide this heat, electricity for heat. So all in all, um, these many sectors, many questions um, that, that intersect. And uh, as a result, we will need uh, a type of analysis that covers a lot of sectors, but also has a lot of uh, spatial temporal detail because of course fluctuations of renewables, for example, is something um, that depends very much on the hour and very much on the place. So it's, it's difficult to capture. Um, so now I come to the general method or the model we deployed to answer the questions outlined earlier. Um, this is a techno-economic optimization model um, that optimizes uh, power supply and energy supply in general um, for a given demand. And um, as I said earlier, I think um, the most uh, unique features uh, about it are the scope and both the detail it covers. Um, in terms of spatial detail, this means uh, it's the whole uh, European continent uh, covered um, with a minor addition that we also allow for hydrogen import from other regions outside of Europe. In terms of detail, we cover 96 regions and we also cover the um, transmission grid between these regions to exchange electricity. In uh, terms of temporal scope, it addresses a pathway, so we're not focused on a single year, but we're modeling the pathway from today's system to 2050, how the energy system has developed, but we are at least at the moment um, restricted to one uh, climatic year of weather data. In terms of details, we are currently working with uh, 60 representative days to, to model the whole year, but we are seeking to, to further improve that. And uh, a special feature that we um, deployed in this kind of research 
is to have different resolutions for each NFG carrier to keep the computational complexity manageable. So for example, when we are modeling uh, the power system, we are applying one hour steps in the model because here we want to closely capture all those uh, fluctuations of solar and wind. But for heating, for example, we apply uh, four hour steps instead um, to model that there's a thermal inertia in buildings and a certain uh, inherent flexibility to heating that allows you to uh, look at the uh, demand, um, the energy balance only in four hour steps. And uh, lastly, but probably more importantly, there's the sectoral scope in detail. So this is a full energy system model, meaning it does not look uh, only at um, investment and dispatch for the power sector, but it includes uh, the electricity, the transport, and for this presentation, most importantly, the heat sector. Um, this includes both the residential and the industrial heating demand, and uh, specifically um, space heating and process heat. So we have a space heat uh, in the model, but we have also four different temperature, three different temperature levels of industrial heating demand for processes. So after all, um, this sums up to about 160 technologies in the model. And um, since you, what you can reckon from, from this slide is, uh, that this is especially the sectoral scope is quite large. And um, so I'm not an expert only on heating, but I've uh, tried to cover several things at the same time. So I'm um, especially interesting about your feedback from like the heating expert. Um, what do you think about the modeling if it's plausible and if you have any heavy inputs? Um, specifically for the heating part, which I will focus on um, now for the rest of the presentation of the model, we introduced um, several uh, new features. Um, on the left side, you can see how energy system models like the one presented typically used to model the heating sector. And um, the logic that is applied in the heating sector usually is the same logic applied uh, for other energy carriers as well. Most importantly, electricity. That means we have a demand the black curve in the diagram. And then we have different technologies that can uh, be invested in and dispatched to satisfy this demand. And um, without further restriction, what the model will automatically do is what we know from the power sector, that there are base load technologies, which are um, the most efficient technologies with the smallest marginal costs, um, but maybe the highest investment costs and that are used uh, with the highest full load hours. And then we have uh, the next technology that has slightly higher marginal costs, but um, smaller investment costs and so forth until we have like a peak load technology, which is in our case, the oil boiler that is only deployed for the peak load. So of course, in the electricity sector, this term of type of modeling is highly plausible. And it's, uh, as we all know, how electricity markets are actually uh, working. But in the heat sector, um, we realized that this always leads to very flawed model results because actually um, heating technologies are very diff differently deployed. A, because there is no national market for, for heat like this for electricity because heat cannot be um, transported that easily. And it's more like everybody has um, a residential heating technologies installed in their basement. And once there is a demand, all technologies ramp up equally. So there's a sort of must run deployment concept that we implemented into the model that is sketched on the right side that shows um, that there's not this merit order logic, but that uh, um, all technologies always deployed sort of proportionally to the installed capacity. And this has the advantage that it's only, not only uh, more realistic, it's actually um, from a computational perspective uh, easier to model because you have much degree, much less degrees of freedoms in the model and effectively uh, smaller equations, which is um, stylized by the modeling equations below, but I don't think um, go into the details there for now. Um, so this is not the only advancement. The other advancement is that we look when we look at a heating technology, we um, do not only look at the conversion, so this is for example, the conversion is in this um, representation of a heat technology shown in the upper part where you have on the left side an energy carrier coming in. In this case, it's electricity in yellow that is used by the electric heat pump um, to generate heat. 
that would have then to satisfy this profile that is here mapped out on the right uh, chart. Um, but the profile can also be satisfied um, from the internal heat storage of the system. So when the um, electric heat pump creates heat, it actually has um, this degree of freedom to either use it to deploy the direct demand or charge it into the eternal heat storage of the technology and discharge it at a later point, maybe when electricity prices are high or electricity is scarce to satisfy demand in that situation instead of generation. So, so far I've mostly talked about um, how our residential heating or how our local heating systems um, implemented. But of course the talk is uh, about district heating and district heating is also an important part to the question. And how district heating comes into the pictures, I will explain um, based on this graphic, this, which gives an overview of all the heating technologies that are available for the model for investment and operation. And um, generally in this graphic, the, the energy carriers are um, symbolized by the squares. So for example, we have electricity, which is very important, and we have hydrogen on the right side. And all the technologies are um, symbolized by these gray dots. And you can see how a technology converts an energy carrier from one into the other based on the edges in the graph. So for example, um, if we look at the heat pump that takes in the electricity vector, and uh, in this case, either creates space heating or the other types of heat uh, that I will come to in a moment. And um, to give you an idea of the general model behind that, in the general model, there are not just these heating technologies, but there are all sorts of power generation, hydrogen conversion technologies. As I said earlier, um, it's around 160 technologies. And I just mapped here um, to keep it, or at least try to keep it uh, <laughs> manageable, only the heating technologies. And what we have in the model, for example, in the case of uh, residential heat or space heat, um, you see in the lower left, like we have a demand for space heating. And that can either be satisfied by all the space heating technologies that we see there. Um, for example, HP water obviously stands for heating pumps water or heating pumps air. And for these technology, also this must run logic that I um, talked about earlier applies. Um, but the alternative is that this heat is instead provided um, by district heating or by local heating. And to represent this, we have um, distinct technologies, for example, the district heating excess um, that you see in the upper part of the space heating bubble. And uh, this technology is basically just take, representing the excess in the house to the district heating network. And it also requires an investment and it requires an input carrier. And this input carrier is of course the district heat generated in the network. And all the technologies that can create district heat within the networks are then depicted in the upper right. And the um, biggest and most important difference between this technology to the uh, space heating technologies is that in the district heating network, this must run concept does not apply because in district heating networks, we know that we actually can have an exchange between different technologies and uh, peak load and the base load technology and um, are actually flexible to operate our plants uh, as we want. And for local heating, uh, the concept is methodologically the same. Um, it's just that we have other costs, uh, smaller um, economies of scale, but the general concept of, of implementation is the same. So um, the next step that I will show is the results that we get from this model when we optimize the entire energy system. And then I will cause, uh, of course, a particular focus on the results for, for the heating sector. So this uh, shows the result for the final year of modeling for heat generation in 2050 in Germany. Um, on the left-hand side, um, it's how our space heating is deployed. And this is heavily dominated by heat pumps. And this not only includes the indirect generation, but also a significant share of, of heat is um, stored within the residential homes from the heat pumps and then discharged at a later point um, to allow the heat pumps to operate more flexible. Then also a certain share comes uh, from district heating. Um, and uh, I should note at this point, we have a lower limit for district heating in the model. 
um, because not um, because and this represents the houses that are today have an access to a district heating network, and the model actually just meets this this minimum share at the moment with the cost data with, with which we are using at the moment, which is to be frank not um, still could be calibrated better and something we're looking to improve. On the process heat side, the picture is a little different. On for the low temperature heat, which is heat um, until 100 degrees, it's still dominated by heat pumps. But as we get to higher temperature levels, electric heating and especially heat pumps are not available necessarily. Um, so we have higher shares of uh, bio engines on the one hand and at the very high temperature, which is uh, the temperature above 500 degrees, um, the electric heating share is, is negligible because the potential for electric heating there is just very small and um, it's mostly dominated by um, bio boilers and hydrogen boilers. So these were the total quantities, but what is uh, most uh, more interesting probably also from the um, system perspective and uh, from the district heating sectors are the um, profiles. And I um, sketched this here. Uh, the left column is always uh, a low demand day and on the, on the right column you see a high demand day. So I'll start with the uh, left side. Um, the upper row, shows you um, the general um, space heating generation. And then the lower row um, will, will detail how um, the specific red part in the upper model, um, which is the district heating is covered. So um, we see some discharging uh, during the day um, of, the, of the heat pumps, which is uh, plausible, I guess. But uh, more interestingly, we also um, see compared to the right side and um, when we look at the district heating networks that um, sort of the base load of heat is always supplied by heat pumps, ground source heat pumps in the district heating networks. Um, but when we get to high demand share, uh, CHP plays an important role um, to cover the heat demand. And at some point to a certain degree, even hydrogen boilers. So the use of hydrogen without CHP is used. And um, if we look closer into the results, um, you see that the benefit actually from using CHP in the district heating networks to cover peak demand is um, quite favorable because the heat and the power peaks are closely correlated. And um, whenever we are requiring um, substantial or ex exceptional high levels of heat in the heating network, um, there's usually also a shortage of, of electricity in the electricity market. And um, so actually the only thermal backup plants that the model uh, will build are the CHP plants uh, in the district heating networks. So we see um, in this renewable system, uh, a close synergy, you might say, between uh, peak load coverage for heat in district heating networks and electricity in general. So to come to the conclusion, uh, what are the current limitations? Um, for one hand, um, that is, we are still missing some uh, important technologies um, and also some of the technologies that are in there um, are not as well represented as they could be because it's very difficult to get uh, Europe-wide data on potential. So for example, what is the potential from co-generation uh, from geothermal? What is the potential for waste heat, not only uh, per country, but also in the, in the well, what is the temporal profile of, of waste heat that is available? Also the temporal detail and scope, as I said, we computed this with 16 days could still be improved, especially when um, you are keeping in mind that we're looking at uh, backup capacities and extreme events. Um, at, at the moment, we are still assuming a constant demand levels um, due to lack of other data sources. Um, but I think what um, findings can already be made is uh, what I said earlier, yeah, um, that A, cogeneration is, is, is useful to cover the highly correlated peaks of electricity and, and heat demand but that the most general efficient strategy to decarbonize heating and also district heating um, is not the use of hydrogen, but the use of, of electricity and uh, in particular heat pumps. Um, and something that the results suggest that we were not looking um, too much into is um, how could 
co-generation plants, and I'm not necessarily talking only about um, CHP plants in the classical sense, but also uh, smaller scale fuel cells in local heating networks, if they could be operated more flexible, um, and also investment would allow for different heat to power ratios, there's, I think, um, additional benefits uh, for these technologies that are yet not covered, because, again, um, it was difficult for us to obtain technology data that specified, um, for example, for uh, fuel cells, uh, but also for other uh, co-generation plants, fueled by hydrogen, what might be the operational flexibility that these plants can give us. And um, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. I, I bet it keep sharing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, I, I do have one, actually, I didn't see. Is there a, a hand raised? No, I do have one, actually, about the, the modeling that you um you mentioned at the beginning so regarding the uh, meteorological conditions and um, the the heating days you said you have 16 representative days for your modeling uh what what does that mean is it like you have uh one week of autumn and one week of really cold winter or something like that to you model your uh, heating demand and you expand it to like uh, four months or six months, I don't know, from October to March or something like that? Um, what we have in the beginning is just uh, an hourly time series and then we run a K-means clustering algorithm to select like 16 um, representative days. And um, that's pretty much it. So when we checked, it did preserve like the seasonal structures you talked about, but we are not um, specifically um, ex under uh, specify what types of days to select. Um. This, so for instance, you're not looking at if it's a day of the week or weekends and things like that? Um, no, not, okay. we trust the clustering in, in that case. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Pedro. Your, your mic is off. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I have a comment about the, the representative or these uh, representative days. We have used uh, typical weeks uh, in our modeling, uh, mathematical modeling. Uh, we also run a time series clustering uh, methodology uh, or optimization. Uh, uh, pre-processing methodology um, and we also let the the, 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 the optimization uh, decides which week of the year we we, we just um, give uh, how many weeks we want uh, for instance where we choose seven weeks with an hourly resolution also, um, uh, plus an eighth uh, week for the peak, where the peak demand is. Uh, we, 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 we do make this, this, this selection for, um, yeah. Um, we also, we were thinking on choosing days, uh, but um, apparently it was not, uh, the difference of the result was not too high, just the um, uh, efficient, the, the, um, the, um, the simulation running time was the only difference, but the difference and the result was not too, too different, I would say. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's interesting. I never thought about taking an entire week instead of selecting specific days. Makes sense. Yeah, because the, dy the dynamics are different. I, yeah. I mean, you can you can repeat you have the same cycle, and you have a longer period. Are different. They're different uh, scales, but 
general was the same result. The faster. <laughs> okay, if there are no other questions, uh, we have a little bit more time if, if you want before I start my presentation. But if not, I can we can move to the to the next one. Okay, I think there's no other question. So thank you, Leonard. And uh, and yeah, thank you for the end of, of the conclusion of your presentation because it's made perfect transition with my <laughs> presentation on, on electrification of heating, uh, even though it's not district heating at all. And uh, also, um, I, I must say, I'm, I'm kind of happy that uh, in this district session, uh, everybody seems to know a lot about about um, about heating. I am so I'm from the French TSO. Uh, can you see my screen? And um, yes. yes, put full screen now. Yes, so Perfect. do you see the right? Yeah, okay. So I'm from the French uh, transmission uh, operator RTE, and I usually I speak with a electric electricity system experts, and they're not that aware of heating demand and things like that. And here, I think everybody's very well aware of that. So uh, maybe some of the things I will present to you will be kind of obvious, but uh, yeah, it will allow us to understand each other and, and maybe go a bit faster, I don't know. So um, the, the study that I'm going to present you today um, is about decarbonization of energy consumption uh, through electrification. Uh, does it really work? And uh, I will be talking about the case of heating in France. And uh, it was a study conducted in RTE, but we also had a partnership with ADEM, the environmental agency, uh, since they, they have uh, Kind of um, that data and and uh, on on retrofits and things like that, and they helped us from the for the really building parts, and we were the simulator and modelers for the electricity system parts. Um, so a little bit of context uh, in France today, uh, French households rely mostly on gas and electricity for heating, and that's a pretty high proportion of electricity. Uh, for heating uh, compared to other countries in, in, in Europe, I think, or even in the rest of the world. Um, and especially it's, it's not historically, it wasn't heat, but it was, you know, dual heating that the electric heaters, very old and efficient ones. So that's about uh, 35, 40, 40% of, of what people have in their, in their houses to, to, for heating. Uh, the, the government, the national low carbon strategy in France, wants to go to zero emission in 2050, uh, like other countries and like many of you mentioned in your introductions. Uh, and um, they want to reduce emissions from buildings through ambitious renovation and also through the shift to low carbon energies for heating. So that means both biomass and electricity, since in France, power generation is about 90% low carbon. And uh, we consider that district heating is supposed to go like full biomass by 2052. Um, so it, it's kind of here a group of biomass, uh, if it's well wood in the house, house or district heating, uh, we consider that in future, it's both supposed to be biomass mostly. And in particular, electricity for heating, uh, it should increase from about 60% today of final energy demand to 28% um, uh, in 2050, mostly through the implementation of heat pumps. Uh, so if you want to look a bit more closely on the three main measures to reduce CO2 emissions from heating in the building sector that the, the government is, uh, wants to, to apply, uh, we have three measures. So first is better performance of buildings. So that means insulation. Uh, then you have, sorry, then you have to shift from fossil fuels like fuel and and um, and gas to low carbon energies, including electricity. So that's biomass and electricity. And you have to choose high efficiency heating systems. So if you electrify, rather take a heat pump and a dual heating system. So if you want to go a bit more in, into the numbers, 
uh, insulation, the, the retrofits. The goal is to uh, ret have retrofits on the whole 30 million households by 2050. So the time horizon we will be looking at uh, now will be like midway in 2035. So that means uh, 15 million retrofits by 2035. So that means doubling the rhythm that we have today and also doubling the performance because the retrofits that happen today are not that um, performance, uh, especially because it's costly and long and uncomfortable uh, to be out of your house uh, during the retrofits, etc. And regarding the, the shift from the, the full, full switch, um, for electric heating, as I told you, it's about 40% today, and the shift that is expected to 2035 uh, in, in the government plan is to go to 50, and even in, 20, in 2050, that would be 60-70% of, of, uh, of buildings. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, in the government plan, there's this plan to electrify and it uh, reflects in regulations and things like that that could become a bit more um, favorable for uh, for electricity but uh, the electrification of heating may raise some concerns that's actually what we hear a lot in the public debate in France um, regarding security of supply because it may increase the winter peak so that's the load curve over the year we like to show it from July to June so that we can see the winter in the middle that there's a great you know, seasonal peak. Um, the gray part is like uh, everything else and the blue triangle here is uh, electric heating. And here the little drop here is, um, is a... Um, uh, Noel, oh, I'm losing my English. It's Christmas, yes. It's Christmas holidays here. Um, so th there's already this peak, you know, the load is around, is around 40, 50 gigawatts average. And if you, if you look at the winter peak, it's like 70 gigawatts. And if we add even more, is it going to be okay in terms of security of supply? That's one question. And uh, the other question that really uh, stems from this one is that, yeah, maybe if you're um, in a peak, you're uh, using... Um, fossil fuel generation, uh, maybe uh, gas uh, powered generation or even fuel gen powered generation. So that, that's a picture from our website uh, it, that's called Eco de Mix, where we, we show the hour by hour uh, electricity production of the mix. The yellow is, is nuclear, the blue is hydro and the red is gas. So it's like if you ask for a bit more consumption, maybe you solid state gas and then uh, compared to gas boiler, it, it's not uh, it's not efficient in terms of, of CO2. So that's the second concern. Is, is electrification of heating efficient to reduce emissions uh, with which effects on security of supply and of course at what costs? And uh, here I, I just want to add that as the French electricity transmission system operator, RT has a legal duty to ensure that at every moment uh, when you turn on the light, you have light and then there's no blackout and shortage, etc. So we have a legal mission to ensure that if some changes, long-term changes uh, occur, we have to, the system has to be able to provide. And especially if some electric uses uh, are going to be massively developed like electrical, electric cars or hydrogen or heating, uh, it's our legal mission to be uh, kind of cautious about it and, and calculate and do probabilistic um, calculations to know if, if the system will be okay and we'll be able to provide everybody like uh, we usually do. I mean, we do not provide, we operate the system, but to make sure that there is adequacy between power supply and uh, power demand. So the objectives of the, the research study that we did here was to analyze First, the technical impacts of the development of electric heating, oh, sorry, uh, electric heating on segregate of supply, then um, the environmental impacts on CO2 emissions and uh, some cost analysis on the whole system then to see how much, how much it costs. Uh, so in terms of outline, uh, I've already gone through the objectives. I will now talk to you about the models and methods uh, that we're using uh, in our team um, to, to answer these kind of questions. 
and the scenarios that I will be presenting you are focused on, on three scenarios. We, we studied like five or six and, and some variants as well, but I will just present three main scenarios here. And so the results, uh, as I told you, technical impacts, environmental impacts, and uh, short uh, economic analysis. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, models and methods, um, first I'll, I'll say a word about our consumption model uh, that we call the Madeus. Uh, we have a bottom-up modeling uh, of electricity consumption by a sector. Over 30 electric uses are modeled. Um, for all, all sectors, residential, tertiary industry, et cetera. And uh, of course, in this study, we, um, we, we focused on the, well, residential and tertiary parts and in the um, <clears throat> heating demand part. And uh, then we have historical profiles for each of these uses like uh, heating or lighting, et cetera, so that we can convert our annual demand forecast into an hourly demand load curve. Um, but I think maybe most of you um, use the same kind of, uh, of modeling. And, uh, and of course, it's very important to model the sensitivity of the electricity consumption to how the meteorological conditions are, if it's more, more or less cold. And for this, we are working with the National uh, Weather Organization Meteo France, and they provide us with 200 uh, uh, climate scenarios, it's like 200 uh, years of, of temperatures for each uh, each um, each hour of the year. They're supposed to be representative or of the most plausible um, colder and warmer years that we could experience in in France. So that that gives us a very uh, high sensitivity and probabilistic approach to the, um, to the, the heating and uh, the modeling of heating, which is of course uh, very valuable in this kind of study and for uh, the, the security of the studies for security of square. So then we have our, um, our load curve or 200 load curves in, for demand and we want to uh, simulate the electricity system, how the power plants are going to produce. And for this, we have a probabilistic software called Antares, in which as inputs, we have all the power plants, French power plants uh, modeled with their constraints, their minimum power, maximum power, et cetera. And also we model the other um, connected uh, European countries. So today, the latest version of the model has about 18 countries that are modeled from Spain to, to Poland, uh, mostly. And sometimes it's disaggregated between regions when, when it feels relevant. Um, so that, and we, we keep the interconnection, the cross-border interconnections uh, data up to date to, to be the most accurate as possible. But of course, uh, countries outside of France are modeling a bit more uh, of way. Uh, France is the more detailed model, uh, obviously. So the method to answer the research question that we had for this study. Um, so we, in our model, we have to put the, the generation mix as it's, as it's supposed to evolve till 2035. Of course, we, we make assumptions based on the government plans. Um, we, we, make scenario, we build scenarios for the evolution of electricity consumption for heating, which is the main focus of the study here. And also uh, we make some assumptions for the other uses such as um, uh, EVs, hydrogen, et cetera, because it would make no sense to just consider today's consumption and just uh, project um, future, future uh, demand uh, scenarios just for us, just for heating. So we, we take something like uh, the government objectives on, on EVs, et cetera, uh, to have something that is representative in 2035. And we put that in our simulation model. And as an output, we get um, CO2 emissions as an output of the model, because there they, they are emission factors for each of the technologies in, uh, in the model. Impact on winter peak, so because we have the consumption curves and probabilistic uh, results on when we're going to be tight on, on security of supply and things like that. And uh, we can deduce from that system costs. Um, 
we can calculate them from the outputs of the models. <clears throat> so that's all for the mo uh, models and method that we're using for this kind of, of studies. Um, just a word on the scenarios that I'm choosing to present today. Uh, there are three, th uh, three scenarios. Uh, first, the reference scenario is the one where everything goes well if we implement uh, all the measures, so energy performance uh, of the buildings, um, shift from fossil fuels to low carbon energies, including electricity and high efficiency uh, heating systems, which means heat pumps instead of dual heaters in electric, electric heating. So then we look at the scenario if efficiency targets are not met. So we, we miss the, the retrofits objective and we electrify with dual heaters. So that's actually kind of catastrophe scenario that is uh, often mentioned in, in the public debate because obviously uh, dual heaters are like, uh, I don't know, three times cheaper than heat pumps or things like that. And um, retrofits also are something that is costly and that people do not, they're not so keen on doing it. So the, the fear in the public debate is that if regulations are starting to be um, to, to encourage electric uh, heating without uh, efficiency standards or high expectations on efficiency, the risk is that we go towards this scenario and um, many people say that it would like cause blackouts, et cetera, because the electric demand would go so high, we could not supply it, et cetera. So the, the purpose here is to quantify that, how, how, much, how much impact that would have to miss uh, the efficiency targets. And then just to, to compare, to, to have a full comparison if all targets are not met. Um, so we, we miss uh, the target on, on retrofits. Uh, we keep our fill in gas boilers and uh, we fail to install heat pumps when, I mean, for the small part of electrification that remains. Um, so I will present the, the results of the three scenarios. Um, first, in terms of technical impacts, so peak and consumption. So if um, all measures are implemented, impacts on the electric system are really negligible. Uh, for the electricity consumption today, the annual electricity consumption for heating is about 60 terawatt hour. And if we go from 40% households with electric heating to 50% uh, household with heat, electric heating, but if that's all heat pumps, that would increase slightly the demand, but also we have all the 15 million retrofits in this scenario. So that compensates um, that compensate completely this this uh, this uh, high, rise in electricity demand, and we are also taking into account a rebound effect that when you do a retrofit, you install a heat pump, um, you will consume a little bit more because uh, it'll be cheaper, etc. So we're taking that into account in order to not overestimate the effects of energy efficiency. Uh, so all in all, it's uh, the electricity demand for heating is stable, okay? And regarding the peak, uh, so what, what I'm showing you is what we call one in 10 peak demand. It's a probabilistic uh, indicator. It's kind of getting old, I guess, uh, but it's kind of like the, the peak demand that you would have in a cold wave, a cold wave so severe, it would happen only once in 10 years or something like that, okay? But today, you know, with, more and more flexible uh, electricity uses than, and demand response, et cetera. This indicator is less and less valid, but still for heating, it gives you an order of magnitude. That, uh, a cold wave is like minus 10 degrees, something like that. Uh, the, the, the load curve that I was showing you earlier, like it's usually 50 and goes to 70, 80 in, in winter. In the worst case, it's, it goes to 100. So that, that's the indicator today. Uh, if we apply all the government plan, uh, it, it decreases a little, so there's no problem of security of supply uh, on, on that side. So then if we have the wrong electrification scenario, as I was saying, uh, so this, this scenario is a bit more 
has a lot more constraint, a bit more constraints on um, on the electricity system. So you you raise electricity consumption by 10 terawatt hour compared to today. Actually, that's not a lot. Uh, if you remember the previous slide, so these 60 terawatt hours, it's about 12% of total electricity demand. So yeah, it's not that much. And even if we take plus 10, uh, it's not much difficult for the system to provide terawatt hours. The problem is the peak, of course. So here, if we do that, dual heaters in non-insulating buildings, uh, that would increase the one in 10 peak demand by uh, about six gigawatts. So then you would uh, definitely need higher uh, flexibility options like um, more vehicle to grid, um, hydrogen and things and more demand response, et cetera. And uh, just to complete the, the trilogy of scenario, uh, the results for the, the scenario where targets are not met. So this, uh, this scenario does not put much constraint on the on the electricity demand. Uh, it's interesting for the CO2 result. That's why I'm showing it to you. But as you can imagine, if we, we do not insulate, but we do not uh, electrify much more, it's just the yeah. business as usual, small electrification that continues a little bit. Um, yeah, that increases a little bit the electricity consumption for for uh, electric heating, but and a little bit the, the, the peak demand, but not that much. Uh, but on the other hand, that means that you, you didn't do this, the fuel switch for uh, the like the 10 million um, households that were supposed to go to heat pumps. So in terms of emissions, uh, what what does what does where does that lead us? So CO2 emissions from heating are, in my point of view, very difficult to assess. Uh, I'd say intuitively, it's not that difficult to assess if you think of gas boilers, fuel boilers, wood that you burn. You just uh, burn something, uh, uh, a fossil fuel, the fossil fuel and then you have emissions okay but then when you go into electric heating so electric heating is something that will consume electricity from the french electricity system mostly and also sometimes well you you're interconnected so you take electricity from the european electricity system so all in all the emissions from electric heating take a little bit of i mean take mostly from the French electric system and a little bit from the imports. And well, I can, I can you know, qualitatively explain it uh, with, with the, this drawing, but when you want to calculate it, that, that's another story. You have to make assumptions, you have to choose like how you're going to divide your emissions in the electric system between all the electric uses, et cetera. And that's, that can be done in a lot of ways, and that's uh, the source of lots of debates in France. So that's why here we try to assess what we will gain uh, here from the emissions from fossil fuel, um, heating, we do retrofits, we do full switching, so we reduce that part. And then we will look at the whole electricity system is this going to have uh, more emissions? Are we going to, to generate a lot of emissions in this perimeter because uh, this fuel switch uh, will uh, use a lot of uh, gas power components? That, that's the result that we're trying to look at. So first, the reference scenario, if all measures are implemented, let's look at just the uh, fossil fuel heating uh, part, okay? So it's 50, 50 something million tons of CO2 in France today for the whole building sector. And the, the purple here is full, it's mostly gas and a little bit for biomass and district heating. Uh, and uh, if, if we implement all the measures in the government plan, uh, you reduce by a bit more than half. Uh, so you have natural trends like new builds and demolitions of old buildings. Then you have the, the insulation plan, the retrofit plan. Uh, and then you have fuel switch. So the part that switches to electricity and the part that switches to biomass, uh, et cetera. And uh, also the gas network has to decarbonize a little bit by, by having more and more biogas in it. So that's from the point of view of just the, the, 
fossil fuel uh, heating part. Um, so if you want to look at um, electricity as well, so in so this is just a summary of the, the graph we just saw um, <clears throat> on the electricity system. So the electricity system in France today it's about twenty million tons of CO two. Oh, sorry, that's still in French. <laughs> Um, and uh, with uh, phasing out of coal, increased share of renewables, in 2035, uh, the French system will be about 11 uh, million tons of CO2 per year. Uh, so obviously, if we do everything as, as planned, uh, there, is no, there is no increase in emissions in the electricity system in France. And if we look at the broader uh, European um, Scope. There, there are no uh, increase in in imports per year, so uh, there are no um, like carbon leakage to to the rest of Europe. Um, so, in the reference national, the, the reference scenario in the national low carbon strategy, uh, well, everything goes well, I'd say. And that that's, uh, I mean, that sounds pretty obvious, uh, I know, but that's actually. Uh, first uh, quantification, first answer, because in public debate, some people were also saying that the national low carbon strategy would maybe increase uh, uh, emissions at the European level because of import and export, etc. So that, that's the first result. Then uh, let's look at the, the bad scenario if efficiency targets are not met. Uh, then, uh, so you fail to achieve the retrofit target and you electrify your 10 million households with joule instead of heat pump, then you generate six additional million tons of CO2 compared to the target. So you don't not make it. Uh, and if you look at the European scale, that's 11 uh, million tons CO2 that are added. But that means that, um, so in France, you've increased a little, you've increased the fossil fuel generation because you, you haven't insulated all of your household, et cetera. So fuel, um, yeah, yeah, uh, remaining fossil fuel heaters, et cetera, they're, they're emitting more because the, house, the, the houses are not as well insulated. And then on the, uh, the also the electrified uh, homes are less uh, insulated than in the reference case. So you emit a little bit more in France, but actually uh, it, it's more like France will export a bit less and that will cause uh, more, a bit more uh, emissions in, in Europe. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that, that's the, the result on really the European scope. And if all targets are not met, efficiency and electrification, uh, then, uh, well, in France, you will have 11 additional million tons of CO2 because you didn't do the fuel switch, you didn't insulate the houses, et cetera, and you didn't do the fuel switch. So you have uh, more, you have fuel, uh, for instance, fuel boilers are supposed to disappear, and here they are still uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the building sector. Um, so that here you have this surplus, and for the electricity system in France, more or less the same than the previous scenario. Uh, but you see that at the European scale, it's the scenario that has even more um, supplementary emissions compared to the reference case. So it means that if you fail to, to do the efficiency, electrifying is still a bit better than not doing the fuel switch as well in terms of CO2. So, <clears throat> Now let's say a word about how much all of these costs. Uh, so I'll, I'll be pretty quick on the economic analysis, uh, even though we, we spend a lot of hours on that too. <laughs> uh, so in terms of cost assumption, so we, we want to quantify what happens on the whole system, but then the, the, the transformation is mostly having the retrofits and installing the, the heat pumps. So we, we Two cost assumptions based on retrofit literatures, especially our partner Edem, had uh, an extended, I mean, a, a very a thorough review of, um, of retrofits operation and the uh, co cost data that we, we took um, from, from this report. Uh, and to be, to be a bit 
to be really clear, I mean, when you, you hear about retrofits, uh, sometimes it takes into account, so you, you insulate the walls, you change the, the windows, etc. But it also sometimes take, takes into account changing the heating system, sometimes not. So here we separate both, okay? We, we talk about retrofits that are just insulation, the, the walls, etc. For this, we were between one, 100 and 160 euro per, met, uh, per square meter. And for heating systems, so switching to uh, from a gas boiler or a fuel boiler to a heat pump or dual heating, etc. We had these costs that came from from the same database. Um, and um, all in all, uh, we calculated the cost of scenarios, and we deduced from that the uh, CO2 abatement cost, because that, that's something we want to see to kind of see if if this policy is efficient in terms of uh, of uh, abatement costs. Uh, but uh, the result is that it's pretty actually it's actually pretty costly. But the reference scenario, when you do everything and you do it well, it's about 400 euros per ton CO2. Um, the, if if you just try to go halfway and just electrify with heat pumps, so that's that's a variant that I didn't show you. It's like you don't do everything wrong. You forget about insulation, but at least you don't install dual heaters, you only install uh, heat pumps. So that's not the worst scenario, but still you don't achieve your target. That's actually much more economically uh, attractive because the, the cost of retrofits are actually much bigger than the cost of, um, of, uh, of switching to heat pumps at, at French scale, of course. Um, also, we tried uh, a variant where we focus on the most energy consuming buildings, um, like very old houses or old buildings. Uh, and instead of, of uh, having our retrofits on, on 50 billion households, I mean, without a selection, uh, we try to have like 8 million, but really, really focusing on, on the, on the, on the, oldest and less efficient buildings, and that seemed economically relevant. Um, so yeah, uh, the conclusion still is that uh, this uh, buildings and energy transition seems to be costly, but there are also benefits that are very hard to, um, to quantify because all the energy efficiency that we model, it, increase, it includes an um, increase in comfort because there is a rebound effect and a rebound effect it's not, well, it can be seen as people are spilling uh, energy and uh, not being uh, virtuous, but um, there's also the problematic of, of energy poverty. And we, we talked about that uh, with the elast price elasticity uh, study uh, uh, earlier in the session. So there, there's energy poverty and things like that. Um, so if we, we try to um, separate the comfort effect and just the efficiency effect, we, we try to uh, model the, we modeled the, the same scenario, the reference scenario without a rebound effect. And uh, well, of course, then the energy savings were much more important and the abatement costs become around 250 euros per ton CO2. So that kind of helps uh, trying to separate the, the part on, on, uh, on uh, efficiency and comfort. So in conclusion, I'll just finish quickly because we only have three minutes left, sorry. Uh, all measures need to be implemented to achieve the CO2 target. There are no uh, transferred uh, emissions to the rest of Europe in these scenarios at least. Uh, and each individual measure has an impact. So even if you do half of, of the measures, you'll still get something. You don't achieve the target, but you get something. But it's pretty costly and um, well, um, there are, I mean, difficult benefits that are difficult to quantify as well. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them in the last three, three or so minutes. Yeah, I have a, uh, there is, yes. sorry, there is one, one and Yes, um, Pedro or Elena? 
I think Pedro was first. I was clapping. <laughs> but I do have okay. a question. But can look if you want. No, uh, please go ahead. You were first. Okay. <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Bianca. It was really interesting, and I just wanted to tell you um, uh, one input for our our model. Uh, was also the carbon prices, this carbon tax, and um, there is a, a whole a complete story about it. Um, the prices are quite similar, I would say. Um, oh, okay. There is a trend in the first years, uh, a little bit lower, 50 euro per ton. But after that, after the year 2030, 2040, 2050, <laughs> you see you, you reach the, the mark of the 400. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. very reassuring. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want, yeah, I just wanted to, to share with you that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Leonard, did you did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question um because that's also something I was, was wondering about in my modeling is uh, regarding the, the load flexibility of um electric heating. So is it uh, first of all something that is um, physically and viable and also acceptable to say maybe uh, people have to shift their heating by two or three hours around the peak and uh, how could it be especially from a grid operator's perspective be enabled um, that they actually do so and have an incentive to act accordingly yeah we had that question a lot and we asked ourselves this question a lot because in the scenario where you, you your peak is is much increased and you need to find flexibility we were wondering how much we can count on, on this heating that caused this peak to be flexible and 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 make the problem go away um so um, well, we um, what we did. I mean, in 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 the main scenario, we did not consider much flexibility for heating. But to our scenario to so 2050, definitely we have to include that. Um, and uh, what it seems is that we can we can have that kind of demand response in the most insulated or newest buildings where there is uh, inertia, and if you cut the heating for one or two hours then uh, people won't feel it. But on the other hand, they consume not, they don't consume a lot. So the, the gigawatt that you get from that are not that much. So all, all in all, yeah, may, we thought that maybe we could find between one and uh, I don't know, four gigawatts, uh, something like that by just selecting the most insulated newest buildings and applying to them uh, uh, something like uh, half an hour or, or 20 minutes uh, demand response uh, cycles, things like that. Uh, but the acceptability question is, is, is really hard. There's an aggregator in France now who's trying to have uh, aggregate consumers around the uh, flexibility of heating, but it's really, really small capacity that he's offering right now. And we have to see if that goes uh, higher or not in the future, I think. But excellent question, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Can I, can I ask you one question? Yes, please. Uh, can, can, can you please show me again the last slides, the very last? The very last, the conclusions or? Yes. 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 So, um, uh, so here you discuss the multi multiple benefit of uh, energy efficiency, right? And um, I was wondering how how do you quantify uh, these multiple benefits? Because it's, uh, I think this is a very odd topic. Uh, if you, as an outsider perspective, if you look at the uh, application of international energy agency that is pushing, or it seems it's that is pushing for governments for investing in energy efficient for, in for implementing energy efficiency policies one of the ways that they are trying or the main way that they are trying to convince government to to prioritize energy efficiency is the narrative of multiple benefits 
the question is multiple benefit is are there most likely are there we have health benefit uh, and many other benefits that are related to energy efficiency improvement especially energy efficient retrofits but the problem is that they are very difficult to quantify yes. uh, and uh, there are ways can be cost benefit analysis or other ways but so far at least to my knowledge is that there is no good method that say okay if you invest this you get this benefit and then you can use that as an argument to convince policymakers to prioritize energy efficiency. Because if you convince the, minist the Ministry of Energy about the importance of energy efficiency, you can do that. But then the Ministry of Energy has to convince the other ministry to use part of the budget in that policy because then as a cascade effect on the health system and so on so my question is and i conclude so how would you quantify these benefits that are related to energy efficiency beyond uh, energy savings and co2 emission reduction yeah that that's an yeah my, my sound is on okay it's an excellent question and i think as yeah we, we're mostly I mean, engineer researchers, and we would need um, skills in macroeconomics to answer that question. So I, I see two main benefits, it's health and uh, employment, because they are relocating uh, some kind of area rather than importing gas and, and oil. You, you have uh, jobs uh, and, and jobs um, that develop inside the country. So I, th I think that there are two, uh, the two big uh, positive externalities that you can you can stem from from energy efficiency uh, policies, but then you would need to have maybe a macroeconomic model, a general equilibrium model, or something to mm -hmm. to have a um, quantified uh, assessment of that. And yeah, maybe maybe you you know more about these models than than I do, but that 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 was our our conclusion that we we need maybe to to create a, a small program on macroeconomics to quantify that. But in in the scale of this study, uh, it was beyond our capacities. <laughs> oh, I'll just, just ask because I, I mean I don't know, so that's why I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, and, and another very quick question. Uh, you touch upon issues of peak consumption and so on. Uh, I don't know if I didn't pay so much attention, but um, how is France doing in terms of um, dynamic pricing? Because, of course, one of the way to at least potentially reduce peak consumption is peak shaving through the introduction yes. of, uh, of this dynamic tariff. But in many countries, it's like... Uh, yeah, they want to do it, but then, uh, and also the response to this price can be, yeah, uh, I mean, it's difficult, it's difficult to change habits. habits. Uh, so how is France doing about these, um, are utilities providing the opportunity, are offering dynamic pricing to households and industry or not? Um, so there are, um, there are actually kind of, very, I mean, old schemes that exist for have been existing for um, tens of, of years, like um, peak hours and 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 not off peak hours for uh, the heating of water. Uh, so that exists actually. I think France is on one of the only countries that does that, and that <clears throat> so it does peak shaving for uh, all the um, water heaters, uh, electric water heaters, and it switches their their electricity consumption to like midnight or 2 a.m. Uh, so that that's a very ancient uh, scheme that that we have in France, and I think that it's starting to emerge in other countries as well. And then um, there were uh, like some uh, tariffs with um, with kind of demand response schemes in them. Like you have uh, some days, you know that uh, the coldest days usually, uh, you know that in your contract you have some days where we, you will they, I mean, they will tell you in advance, okay, we're, we're forecasting that this week, uh, three or four days are going to be much um, 
the price for you is going to be much higher to encourage these people to have a kind of uh, it's like semi semi dynamic uh, demand demand response. And I think that recently uh, there are more and more um, dynamic demand response schemes that are developing, but with very small quantities for now. Um, and I see that one of my colleagues is in the room. If you want to answer that, uh, he's welcome to. <laughs> um, but um, um, uh, I think that uh, we're, we're studying the demand response uh, for, with dynamic pricing for electric vehicle, for instance. And uh, what we see is that sometimes for a very simple off-peak hours and peak hours signal and a very refined dynamic pricing, the economic value that the customer will get from the very refined dynamic pricing scheme is not that higher from the very simple one. So um, what we think now is maybe the peak shaving could be done with simple schemes um, like the one that exists for um, uh, water heaters. But I, uh, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. But I think with, with V2G, et cetera, I mean, and all the connected uh, link, linky, um, uh, you know, the electric co co counter, uh, we're going to have more and more dynamic uh, pricing, yes. Thank you. Okay, I see that Clemence has put her camera on. <laughs> this is too. Yes, I think, I'm sorry, but yeah. we are going to stop here. Yes. Because there is another session going now, so just to avoid the simultaneous uh, Sessions. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, for all the presenters. It was really nice. And I hope that next yeah. time we can see each other in real life <laughs> in a conference. Hopefully. Hopefully. Thanks a lot to all of you. It was really inter interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.